Okay, students. So today we'll be discussing the current affairs for the day twenty, uh, for the day eighth uh, of February two thousand twenty-two. Uh, the first topic for the day would be the police action on social media posts. So I'm sure you must have all uh, come across the communal violence that happened in Tripura uh, as a repercussion of the communal violence that started off in Bangladesh. So about a couple of months back, because of the communal violence in Bangladesh due to the Durga Puja festivities. it uh, spilled over into tripura and there was a lot of communal violence in tripura as well the state of tripura so in order to prevent the communal violence from going on uh, the state start the state police started enforcing a lot of these uh, security national security acts uh, in order to prevent certain uh, unwanted anti nationals to spread uh, misinformation and all of that but in the process there are allegations that the state uh, police were using force even against lawful expressions of freedom of speech and expression so the supreme court on monday orally accused the tripura police of harassing people who take to social media on the communal violence that occurred in the state the bench noted that the police have continued to issue notices to people for their social media posts despite a protective order from the court earlier the supreme court had actually protected people to be able to use the freedom of speech and expression in what's a way possible in so far as not affecting the internal security and order that is present in the country now the court was the court order was passed in case of some lawyers and journalists who were booked under the UAPA act for their social media posts now for this you need to understand what the uapa act is in india we have a lot of national security acts i can give you some examples such as the preventive detention act the maintenance of internal security act of 1970s the national security act the cafe posa then the tada terrorist and disruptive activities act pota prevention of terrorist activities act all of these are laws which are related to maintenance of national security So similarly, one other such law is the UAPA, Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, and as the name suggests, it tries to prevent unlawful activities from happening. Now, now what are some of the features of this UAPA Act which makes it very dreaded? The Act was enacted in 1967. It aims at effective prevention of unlawful activities and associations in India. unlawful activities and associations it prevents even the associations from taking out unlawful activities within india now in 1967 it was enacted so under the act there are certain unlawful activities which are published in a gazette so there is a gazette under the act under which we have several unlawful acts which are mentioned so these unlawful acts did not include terrorist activities until the year 2004 so until the year 2004 the government had to keep enacting out laws such as tada pota in order to curb terrorist activities in the year 2004 what happened was terrorist activities were made as an ambit under the gazette of uapa so now even terrorist activities are under uapa and organizations which are indulging in terror activities can be charged with uapa now what are some of the provisions of the uapa act in order to deal with unlawful crimes it deviates from the ordinary legal procedures and creates an exceptional regime where constitutional safeguards of the accused are curtailed what does this mean this means that under the crpc under the crpc usually most of the offenses the charge sheet has to be filed within about 60 days to 90 days however 
in the case of UAPA offenses, the charge sheet can be filed till 180 days. Also, in the case of UAPA, it is very easy to deny bail. The court can deny bail under UAPA if it believes that prima facie, if it believes prima facie that the said entities indulged in unlawful activities. It is enough if the court believes so. Whereas, in the other cases, the court automatically provides for bail. That is the golden rule of the IPC or the CRPC. Whereas, in the case of UAPA, if the court even believes remotely that it might have happened, then bail can be denied. So, you notice that, that the bail as a default can be denied over here. Whereas, under other offenses, bail as a default can be given. Okay, recent changes to the UAPA Act. Now, you also need to know that under UAPA Act, we have punishments which range from life imprisonment to death by hanging. So, this is also possible under UAPA Act. Now, recent changes in August 2019. This becomes all the more important because it is a recent change. It includes the provision of designing, uh, designating an individual as a terrorist. Prior to the August 2019 amendment, only organizations could be designated as terrorist organizations. But however, now, since August 2019, even individuals can be declared as terrorist terrorists so it has increased the ambit then it also empowers the director general of national investigation agency to grant approval of seizure or attachment of property when the case is investigated by the said agency now do you see what is happening over here this increases the powers of the center why because the national investigative investigation agency directly reports to the center it is on the ministry of home affairs so, it automatically increases the ambit of the center to intervene in law and order, which is a state subject. Now, it empowers the officers of the NIA of the rank of inspector or about to investigate cases of terrorism in addition to those conducted by the DSP or ACP or above rank officer in the state. Which means that the inspector rank officer of the NIA is equivalent to a DSP rank officer or an ACP rank officer at the state level. This is what the act is making. Now, there are certain other provisions of the act which would be good to remember. Like, uh, what are the sections which are used to denote a terrorist act? Section 15 of the act defines a terrorist act. So, remember this section and then remember certain other provisions of the UAPA. Like say for example, even offences which are even conducted outside the territory of India can be prosecuted as if they were conducted within the territory of India as long as they are unlawful under the Act. So, read uh, certain other provisions of the Act. Uh, recently, the Delhi High Court actually held that this terrorist act term under the UAPA should not be used casually. Rather, it should be used in the most in the in the most uh, likely scenarios only. It shouldn't be used in a free-handed ma ma manner. Okay. Now, next, marital rape. Rape as an entity is punishable under uh, the Indian Penal Code. You must have seen sections 375, 
please uh, read the bear act if you ever get the time it will actually increase your interest in polity now the delhi high court on monday asked the center to clarify in two weeks it stand on the issue of criminalizing rape within marriage why in india currently rape under the institution of marriage is not punishable so if a married woman accuses the husband of rape then it is not punishable it is as simple as that now in india marital rape is not defined in any statute or law hence there is an exception granted to husbands under indian rape law the exception to section 375 of the ipc says sexual intercourse by a man with his wife aged 15 years or above is not rape even if it is without her consent please uh, remember this it can be asked uh, in the prelims as a bit so wife aged 15 years or above is not rape however if the wife is aged lesser than 15 years then it can be considered as a rape or recently the supreme court changed the age to 18 years in a judgment now if the supreme court says that below 18 years if at all uh, within the marriage if a woman is forced into rape then it is considered as rape so whatever the supreme court says is the law because the supreme court is the highest interpreter of law in the country so if they ask you an mcq which says that uh, in india uh, even despite marriage if uh, a woman is forced into uh, uh, is forced into sexual intercourse below the age of 18 can a rape case be filed yes it can be filed now what is the problem with the current scenario okay the problem with the current scenario is that you see this the entire thing goes against right of women over their own body they do not have control over their own body if someone is uh, uh is uh, you know forcing them they cannot protest because the law says that marital rape is not recognized it goes against the basic rights of women this exception clause violates the women's fundamental right to equality freedom of speech and expression and most of all right to life and personal liberty under article 21 okay now it has several other problems but the most important is this one the other problems exist which are like you know the national crime records bureau which is responsible for collecting the number of rapes uh, there is a falsified account of the number of rapes that are actually happening violence against women that's actually happening then the doctrine of coverture okay now this is uh, it's a good term you can use it in the main answer the doctrine of coverture <clears throat> this entire concept of marital rape it stems from the british era during the british era i'm sure you must be knowing when the ipc was drafted it was drafted in the 1860s on the basis of recommendations of the macaulay commission the macaulay commission was formed in the 1830s first law commission and on the basis of these recommendations the ipc was enacted out in the year 1860 how so i mean though mr macaulay himself passed away in 1859 i believe and so he could not see the enactment of ipc however okay so under the ipc which was uh, passed in 1860s a married woman was not considered an independent legal entity rather she was considered as a property of her husband because of the patriarchal mindset so it follows the doctrine of coverture which means that a married woman is a part of the husband's uh, property she is not seen as an independent legal entity 
Okay. Now, it's also inconsistent in nature because a husband may be tried for offenses such as sexual harassment, molestation, voyeurism of other women, but not own wife. If the husband commits the same offenses against any other woman, then he can be prosecuted and tried. But in the case of his own wife, he cannot be tried. Now, that is a problem because it sets different parameters for the same people. In the case of his wife, he won't be tried. However, in the case of other women, he can be tried, which means that the wife's rights are getting affected clearly. Now, however, the government argues against criminalizing marital rape. Now, why does the government do that? The government does that because the government feels that criminalizing marital rape has a destabilizing effect on the institution of marriage. Okay. Why? Because once marriage happens, if at all the wife goes to the court saying that, if at all the wife files a case saying that ah, there is a case of marital rape, it affects the entire institution of marriage, then that marriage tends to fall apart. So, in a way, the government argues saying that uh, criminalizing marital rape will threaten the institution of marriage and will also impinge on the right to privacy, which is there for couples themselves. Uh, currently also the Supreme Court in the previous scenarios it has uh, uh, it has uh, held a lot of times that there is a growing misuse of section 498 now section 498 of the IPC it, talk, it talks about the harassment caused to married women by her husband and the in-laws and the protection of women from domestic violence act of 2005 the Supreme Court has pointed out there has been a misuse of these two provisions of the law. It can also be seen in the very few number of convictions that happen. The number of convictions, the number of cases might be 100. Out of that, the conviction rate is lesser than 10. For 100 cases that are filed, less than 10 are convicted. So, it can also result in a misuse of legal provisions. It will add into this. Marital rape will also be misused like these two uh, provisions of law that have been misused. This is what the government says. However, however, uh, we have the J.S. Verma committee recommendations. Uh, Justice J.S. Verma, he has been known as a person of great integrity. He was a Supreme Court judge. Uh, please do read about him if you get uh, the time. Now, he uh, suggests he had had under the commission, he had suggested to make amendments to the criminal law for quicker trial and enhanced punishments for sexual assault of women. The committee suggests to ensure surety over severity of punishments. The punishment need not be severe. Rather, if the offender knows that he will definitely be punished for the offense that he is causing, then that acts as a good enough deterrence and prevents sexual harassment or sexual violence according to the committee the committee also said that rape should include marital rape so these were the recommendations of the committee recently the kerala lokayukta recently okay i will give a little bit of a background story it's not given in the slide uh, recently, the Kerala Lokayukta, it had actually convicted one of the ministers of the Kerala state, Mr. K.T. Jalil. And he said that he misused his powers for for nepotism, which means favoring his own people over the others. And once the Lokayukta gave this verdict, the state government was also forced to terminate his, uh, was forced to terminate his uh, ministerialship. Okay. So recently, the Kerala governor approved an ordinance seeking to amend the Kerala Lokayukta Act. Now, because of this case, the state government wants to curb the powers of the Lokayukta because it feels that it can be misused. Now, 
the proposed ordinance envisages to limit the powers of the anti corruption watchdog the proposal sought to give the government powers to either accept or reject the verdict of the lokayukta which means that whatever is the verdict of the lokayukta the state government need, can or need not accept the verdict while in the previous scenario it was forced to accept the verdict of the lokayukta by this ordinance the quasi judicial institution will turn into a toothless advisory body whose orders will no longer be binding on the government so do you see that the powers of the lokayukta have been done away with with this particular ordinance as it is in the hands of the state government to either accept it or reject it now okay more what is the lokayukta lokayukta is an ombudsman now what is an ombudsman ombudsman is a legal entity which prevents corruption from happening amongst the public authorities the other mechanisms that we have to prevent corruption from happening amongst the public authorities are rti citizen charters cvc so similarly lokayukta is an ombudsman now so whatever is the function that is carried out by the lokpal at the center is conducted by the lokayukta at the state level however these lokayuktas have been existing from a very long time though the lokpal is a very recent phenomenon started off since 2013 and last before year lokpal was finally set up also however lokayuktas have been there in existence from a very long period of time they exist in several states such as madhya pradesh uh, such as uh, kerala etc okay now section 63 of the lokpal and the lokayuktas act of 2013 states that every state shall establish a body to be known as the lokayukta for the state if not so established constituted or appointed by a law made by the state legislature however states are many states had already implemented the idea of lokayukta next states had the autonomy to frame their own lokayuktas and the lokayuktas powers vary from state to state on various aspects such as tenure and the need of sanction to prosecute officials uh, for example chief minister is included within the jurisdiction of lokayukta in the states of himachal pradesh andhra pradesh madhya pradesh and gujarat while he is excluded from the purview of lokayukta in the states of maharashtra uttar pradesh rajasthan bihar and orissa so lok lokayukta's powers vary from one state to another in some states the lokayukta is extremely powerful like the lokayukta of kerala while the lokayuktas in the other states were not are not so powerful now since uh, we spoke about the lokayukta it's also important to read about the lokpal please uh, go through provisions of the lokpal it becomes important because it's a very new entity so uh, how many people are a part of the lokpal it has one chairperson and eight other members now this chairperson has to always be a judicial person and 50% of the members have to be from judicial background the judicial person who is the chair person he also needs to be either a retired court of the supreme retired justice of the supreme court or he has to be the retired chief justice of the supreme court and under the lokpal uh, punishments can be carried out against even the prime minister all the ministers group a b c d officers and everybody so please read about the selecting committee who are the members who select who is the chair person of the lokpal and uh, it's the prime minister and the others please read that and also read if the lokpal 
has its own investigative wing or it if it is dependent upon the CBI and what are the provisions under which the Prime Minister is exempt from the Lokpal and whenever the trial of the Prime Minister happens it has to be under camera and if at the preliminary stage if not more than half of the members of the Lokpal if they are not convinced that the Prime Minister if the uh, charges against the Prime Minister are prima facie true then the charges will be completely destroyed and dropped they will not even be made open to the public even before taking up the case in the preliminary investigation itself so please read about the Lokpal it will be beneficial Definitely there might be a question either this year or the next year. PM Cares Fund. The reason why it's there in the news is because the PM Cares Fund collected 10,990 crores since its inception in March 2020 until March 2021. It spent 3,976 crores during the 2020-21 financial year according to the audited financial statement posted on its website. Remember who posted it? It only posted on its own website, not some other third party entity which audited its records. Okay, more about the fund. The fund was set to deal with any kind of emergency or distress situation like the one posed by COVID-19 pandemic and to provide relief to the affected people. Funds were disbursed for COVID vaccine purchase and testing, ventilators, hospitals, testing labs, oxygen generation plants and migraine welfare also. The fund is a public charitable trust with the Prime Minister as the chairperson. Contributions by companies towards the PM Cares Fund will count towards the mandatory corporate social responsibility. Now, what is the corporate social responsibility? Okay, we know that companies benefit a lot from the societies. How do they benefit? By people uh, marketing their products, by people purchasing their products. Companies make the profits out of the work of the society. Hence, it is also believed that the companies have to give back to the society. This is given in the trusteeship model of Mahatma Gandhiji and ideas of Vinoba Bhave. So, under the Companies Act of 2013, companies with a minimum net worth of 500 crores or turnover of 1000 crores or net profit of 5 crores, any of these things are required to spend at least 2% of the profit for the previous three years average profit of the previous three years two percent they have to spend it on csr activities these can be like providing physical infrastructure or social infrastructure providing education water coolers any sort of thing <clears throat> now the uh, pm cares fund is not subject to the controller and auditor general audit okay now why is it not subject to the CAG audit? Because the Supreme Court itself had held that the PM Cares Fund does not form a part of the Consolidated Fund of India. The Consolidated Fund of India. The PM Cares does not form a part of the Consolidated Fund of India. And hence it is not audited by the CAG. It is not under public scrutiny, doesn't come under the ambit of the right to information. You cannot ask any questions to the PM Cares. Why? Because it is a public charitable trust. Also contributions made to it are 100% tax free. This means that people can donate to the PM Cares and they can deduct it from their taxable income. It will not, however, get any budgetary support, unlike what the government provides for disaster funds, the PM cares funds will not get any separate budgetary allocations. Criticism. I am sure you can understand why there is a criticism because of the obvious lack of trust transparency. 
and there is no accountability of the people who are in uh, charge of these funds. Questions arise over the need for establishing a new fund when PMNRF, the Prime Minister's National Relief Fund, it is already there. So why do we need another PM Cares Fund? That is the question. And there is an opacity surrounding the PM Cares Fund as the trust deed has not been made public. It is not known whether all members of the trust have voting rights or not. There also exist other members of the PM Cares uh, Trust. Though the Prime Minister is the chairperson, we also have the Defence Minister, we have the Finance Minister. All of them are a part of the trust. However, we don't know what the voting, what even the voting conditions are. Forget about where the money is being spent, how much money is coming in, how much is going out. So, and you know, the other criticism is quite clear that out of the total fund that has been received, hardly 30% has been used. I mean, out of the 10,990 crores, around 3,000 crores has been used, which is just like 30%. What happened to the rest 60%, 70%? So, there is no transparency surrounding it. Also, the government's decision to accept foreign donations for PM cares was also critically viewed as the government in the past had refused foreign donations to deal with domestic crisis. During the 2018 Kerala floods, devastating floods, when the UAE and the other Middle Eastern countries had said that they would provide for foreign funding, the government denied it, saying that we won't accept it. Even during the tsunami, I mean after the tsunami happened, uh, that time India was in a condition uh, was under, uh, it had to accept this foreign funding and that was the last time it accepted foreign funding. Since then we have not been accepting any foreign funding. However, for PM Cares, we are accepting foreign funding and that is a big problem. And the other issues, I am sure it's very clear that there is no transparency surrounding uh, the funding. It's not open to RTI. It is not under the Consolidated Fund of India. There is no CAG audit. So yeah, you can see where this is going. Iran nuclear deal talks to resume in Vienna. Iran nuclear deal talks will resume in Vienna on Tuesday. Diplomats said on Monday after Negotiators in recent weeks have cited progress in seeking to revive the 2015 landmark accord. What is the Iran nuclear deal? The Iran nuclear deal, it is also known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA. It was enacted under the presidentship of Barack Obama, who wanted Iran to give up on its nuclear program. Now, the JCPOA was the result of prolonged negotiations from 2013 to 15 between Iran and the P5 plus 1. You know the P5? China, Russia, France, USA and UK. The plus 1 stands for Germany. Now, now under the deal, Tehran agreed to significantly cut its stores of centrifuges, enriched uranium, heavy water. All these are key components of nuclear weapons. The other conditions that Tehran said, Tehran means Iran said that they would follow would be that their nuclear technology would only be used for peaceful purposes like for medical purposes like for generation of energy and all these things and not for weaponry uh, however it is to be remembered that after the presidentship of uh, barack obama since uh, donald trump came up president donald trump criticized the deal he said that it was a very one-sided deal. He pulled the US out of the accord in 2018. He held that he held that the entire deal it did not prevent did not prevent Iran from developing their ballistic missiles program. Iran could still continue with their ballistic missiles program.
the deal also was to be in existence only till 2030. So what if Iran benefits out of the lack of sanctions and starts developing nuclear weapons beyond the year 2030? And the other issue being that Iran was actively supporting militias in Yemen, Houthi rebels, then in Palestine, the Hamas, then in Lebanon, the Hezbollah, Hamas, Hezbollah, Houthis. And the JCPOA did nothing to curb Iran's support of these militias, which were destabilizing the Middle East. So Donald Trump pulled USA out of this deal. He said that it was a very unfair deal. Now, though Donald Trump pulled USA out of the deal, the deal continued to exist because the other countries supported uh, UK, France, and the other countries supported the existence of the deal. So it didn't fall, collapse. However, in January 2020, following the drone strike on Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Commander General Qasem Soleimani, Iran announced that it would no longer observe the JCPOA's restrictions. Now, since Qasem Soleimani was killed in a drone strike, Iran said that they would not abide by the conditions which are imposed by the JCPOA. They started enriching their uh, uranium. They started developing centrifuges. And they started accumulating pressurized heavy water to develop the nuclear bomb. In fact, the amount of uh, enriched uh, uranium uh, that they continue to hold today is near around uh, some 60 kgs of 60% uh, enriched uranium. If the uranium reaches about 90% stage, then it becomes sufficient uh, for developing of nuclear weapons. So Iran is on the path of developing nuclear weapons then its fissile material is enough for developing a nuclear weapon. Currently, Iran holds only 60% enriched uranium. And when it reaches 90% enriched uranium, it can develop a nuclear bomb. Now, current situation. Under President Joe Biden, USA has held that it is ready to re-engage in meaningful diplomacy on the issue. However, USA intends to rejoin the deal but insists that Iran must return to full compliance with the agreement first. But Iran has insisted that USA must lift all of its unilateral sanctions first. So there is a clash between the two. Parties to the deal have been renegotiating in Vienna since 2021 with indirect US participation. For now, USA is not directly participating in the talks, while it is in other room. It is indirectly participating in the talks. The talks are obviously regarding uh, the level of IAEA inspections on different different uh, nuclear facilities in Iran, like the one in Natanz. Uh, how often can the IAEA go and inspect? How much uh, pressurized heavy water uh, pressurized heavy water can Iran hold? Uh, how much of uh, enriched uh, uranium can Iran hold? And all of these. So the talks are currently going on. The significance of the deal for India is that if sanctions on Iran are lifted then Iranian oil becomes cheaper for India. India can start developing the Chabahar port. Development of the Chabahar port will have multiple benefits. Like it can, it can revive the INSTC, International North-South Transport Corridor. Also, Chabahar can be a checkmate for Gwadar. You know what the Gwadar port is, right? The Gwadar port is an outcome of the OBOR initiative between China and Pakistan. Then the Chabahar port can be used for uh, connecting connecting uh, to the Central Asia, for connecting to Afghanistan, for increasing trade with Central Asia. So several benefits exist. So it would be in India's interest if sanctions on Iran are lifted. Then India can also grow close to Iran. But now, because of the sanctions, India has to fo India has been forced to maintain a distance with Iran, which is not liked by Iran. And to deal with the situation in Afghanistan, India needs as many allies as possible. And Iran is a very good ally because Iran has a long border with Afghanistan, just like how it has a border with Pakistan as well. 
so it is of immense strategic importance for india rbi's digital currency plans this is the most important topic for the day now context in the budget presented for 2022-23 the finance minister nirmala sitharaman had announced the introduction of india's central bank digital currency and that the digital rupee would give a big boost to digital economy now she had indicated that the technology such as blockchain would be used by the reserve bank of india to issue the digital currency now first of all what is central bank digital currency central bank digital currency is nothing but virtual form of the hard cash that we have instead of having hard cash you have virtual currency that is as simple as that the cbdc is no different from physical cash except that it would exist in a digital form it would be in a mobile wallet and it will be in digital form rather than having hard cash cbdc will be held in a digital wallet that is supervised by the rbi the rbi's digital rupee will not directly replace the demand deposits held in banks demand deposits are those deposits which you can go to the bank and directly claim they are the exact opposite of a time deposit so uh, digital uh, currency would be just similar to a demand deposit and it won't replace a demand deposit however because physical cash will continue to be used by banks we will also have physical cash and we will also have digital currency now why do we need central bank digital currency the need for digital currency arises because the central banks claim that there is an increasing demand for digital currencies this can be seen from the rise of private private digital currencies such as bitcoin and also the increasing use of digital payments digital payments like paytm google pay phone pay as examples of this trend so central banks are suggesting that there is an increased demand for private cryptocurrencies and for digital payments so why should we not launch our own digital currency this will be tapping into the demand that exists central bank digital currencies are promised as reliable sovereign bank alternatives to private currencies which are volatile and unregulated now see central bank digital currencies since they are launched by the government since they are launched by the rbi they are backed by the sovereign they are backed they are backed by the government of india or the government of any other country and they are hence reliable however private digital currencies private cryptocurrencies they are unregulated we can see that there is extreme volatility in the bitcoin value bitcoin's value once it collapsed from about $62000 to about $53000 overnight which is a loss of around uh, $9000 which is more than which is about 15% volatility in one day now that is a huge amount of volatility and uh, what is a cryptocurrency backed by it doesn't have any asset for example in the case of uh, a company a company has its inventory it has good balance sheet it has an annual financial statement to back up its equity value its stock value whereas cryptocurrencies don't have any entity to back up its valuation there is no asset and hence there is a problem with the private cryptocurrencies there exists more flexibility when it comes to digital currency as opposed to hard cash in terms of usage digital currencies can be used anywhere without exchange of hard cash without searching for change without giving the correct amount of change it provides a an, an ease in the usage central banks also believe that the cost of issuing digital currencies is far lower than the cost of printing and distributing physical cash as it is done electronically now when it comes to hard cash first there is printing cost then there is the chance of a uh, duplication fake cash fake currency and there is also the problem of security you need security guards to assist atm machines you need uh, security guards to assist uh, people transporting cash so there is a problem there are storage costs there is an additional overhead of huge amount which can be avoided in the case of digital currency 
it is also better for the faster transmission of the monetary policy example transmission of cheap money policy by reducing the repo rate so one of the problems with the current existing monetary policy is that even when the rbi reduces the repo rate it is not transmitted properly or adequately fast into the society this can be addressed by using digital currencies because then there is faster transmission of the monetary policy because people adapt it and it can be fast physical cash is hard to trace while digital currency that is monitored by the rbi can be more easily tracked and controlled by the central bank this could have several benefits such as controlling inflation reducing black money etc now physical cash it is very difficult to trace and track the amount of physical cash this results in black money people evading payment of taxes and inflation issues and all of that now this can be avoided in the case of digital cash which can be easily tracked by the rbi as to how much money there exists and where it is being stored and all of that so digital currencies have several benefits however there also exists criticism of the central bank digital currency the demand for private currency comes primarily from people who have lost faith in fiat currencies issued by central banks now for example whenever a country is going through a uh, inflation now uh, or say for example whenever a country does not have enough uh, foreign exchange what the government does whenever they want they need to increase the amount of foreign exchange what they do is they try to make their exports cheaper for this they devalue their currency once they devalue their currency their exports they become cheaper and hence they become more attractive and hence countries get more forex by selling their exports and getting that forex so what happens is that there is a devaluation of the currency that's happening now devaluation of the currency goes against the interest of the holders of that currency and that is a problem so people do not like this interference by the government in the valuation of the currencies so the demand from private currencies the demand for private currencies comes primarily from people who have lost faith in the fiat currencies which are issued by the central banks so this demand that exists for private currencies actually comes from people who don't want the government to be in this field and that is why they go for private currency so even if the government launches it there is high, high probability that these people who do not want the government uh, who do not want the government's currency will not invest in that in will not invest in the central bank digital currency at all uh, hence the digital version of a national currency like the rupee or the us dollar is unlikely to reduce the demand for private currencies like the bitcoin the central bank digital currencies come at the cost of privacy due to the excess transparency that exists see in the previous point in one of the advantages we saw that the rbi always tracks the amount of digital currency that exists that goes against the privacy of the individual who wants to use that uh, uh, currency in whichever way he wants to use it and uh, since it increases the transparency that also affects the demand for that central bank digital currency and hence people might not opt, opt for it at all they might still continue to rely on the private digital currencies that exist like bitcoin and all so this is unlikely to reduce the demand for private digital currency okay so we are done for the day and that's it.